everyone. My name is Erin Shelton. I am the Vanguard Product Manager for Christie Medical Holdings, and I would like to welcome you to our latest webinar on vascular access issues. Before we begin, I want to let you know that throughout the presentation, all attendees' phones will be on mute. If you have any questions or comments that you would like to share, please make sure you're using the chat function. It should be on the right-hand side of your screen for viewing. We will be recording the session for later viewing. The video will be posted on our website under the Education Webinars section. Many of you told us what you would like to learn in this course, and I think you will find some very valuable content. Again, at the end of the presentation, we will be taking questions, which you can send to us by typing your question into the chat section on your webinar screen. We will do our best to get to all the questions, but we definitely want to be uh, cognizant of your time and keep the session to a one-hour time limit. To collect your CE credit, you will be required to complete a brief survey. The survey link will be sent to all participants via email after the session is over. You can also send any questions that you have afterwards to info at christymed.com. Thank you all for your participation in this exciting webinar. Our presenter today is Dr. Gregory Shears. Dr. Shears is a pediatric intensivist and anesthesiologist with a long-standing interest in reducing patient complications and improving our approach to vascular access. He did his pediatric residency at St. Louis Children's Hospital, his anesthesia residency, pediatric anesthesia fellowship, and pediatric critical care fellowship at Johns Hopkins. He worked at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for five years and was recruited to the Mayo Clinic in 2001 to head the ECMO service. There he is the physician liaison to the nurse-led PIC team, medical director of the ECMO service, and co-director of the congenital heart unit. He is on the editorial board for Java and serves on the AVA board of directors as treasurer and recently chaired AVA's strategic planning task force. He is very active with product development and to help reduce complications. And he has given hundreds of presentations locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. So thank you very much, Dr. Shears. And now I would like to turn the program over to you. And it looks like we need to Hi. have you share your screen. Um, oh, no, it is up. Me. All right, thank you so much. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Erin, and um, I would also like to thank um, Christie Medical Holdings for providing this opportunity. Um, it is, uh, I think, a really cool topic and one of, um, that should be of interest to anyone providing health care as it, it gets to a really core problem. As part of my disclosures, I, I have to uh, say that I am a consultant for Christie Medical a maker of uh, vein viewer uh, near infrared uh, devices. Um, uh, and I'm very grateful to them to um, support this effort as they're independently letting me come to uh, speak about a, a topic that's so important to us all. For the, um, over the uh, duration of my presentation, I'm going to talk about three main things. Identify what is currently known regarding optimal peripheral IV sites within guidelines and within the literature, to discuss the use of near-infrared to enhance optimal site choice for peripheral IVs and phlebotomy, and then to hypothesize how near-infrared may help prolong uh, peripheral IV dwell times through reduction in complications. So um, I spend most of my time as a clinician, and um, so those of us who really pride ourselves in the quality of care that we provide going to the patient, we are faced with dilemmas constantly regarding the, um, uh, the quality and integrity of uh, vascular access a patient may have. And um, 
this is a, a smattering, uh, these four frames. These four pictures show some various levels of um, uh, veins one might see. Uh, the upper left, you know, quite visible, multiple, uh, very nice uh, potential targets for placing an IV catheter. The one on the upper right, not so many choices, but uh, with manipulation at the arm, you can get a sense that there is a, a pretty decent distal cephalic vein that one could go after and another one that seems to be um, joining it. And, and this lower corner, even fewer access. Uh, manipulation of the hand reveals only uh, a single clear target, maybe another, but nothing else within the patient. And the lower left-hand panel, nothing. You can, you know, you can um, look all over. There's no visible veins and there weren't any obvious palpable targets. And we uh, approach at least the first three somewhat similarly, which is we go after the patients, we see a potential target, and we stick it. Um, our current knowledge with regard to how do we optimize those sites, site choice, are extraordinarily limited, and I want to emphasize that, and I'm going to um, go over some specific literature with regard to, this, uh, to how do we choose optimal peripheral IV sites. And my argument to you is that it is completely inadequate. So, uh, and this is to no fault of anyone. You know, I, we're, we get information from really good quality organizations like INS. I look at the INS um, guidelines frequently. It's an excellent document and it has raised the level of care tremendously. But with our current level of knowledge, um, there is very little that guides us specifically with the kind of information we need to improve care. So common within the statements, it includes selection of the most appropriate vascular access device and site of placement are critical decisions. We would agree with that. Such decisions require critical thinking and analysis, of course. The decision is generally not based on a single factor, such as drug or solution. That's why vascular access teams are necessary. It's a collection of people focused in this area, and they have the critical thinking skills and the background in order to make these complex decisions for the betterment of patient care. So no argument there. So with regard to um, INS guidance for site choice, there's some key points that they pull out. Uh, the smallest gauge that will accommodate prescribed therapy. Hallelujah. Uh, we can't do enough to promote using the smallest possible catheter. Avoiding uh, areas of flexion. Yes, with flexion is motion. With motion is the possible of injury or dislodgement. So going across the joint or even near a joint, bad idea. So excellent advice. And then choose insertions in the forearm. There is some conflict. Uh, I'll show you a recent paper with regard to that, but generally speaking, that's good advice as well. Um, so, uh, and with regard to assessment, uh, they suggest uh, assessing the condition of the skin, avoiding prior vena punctures, um, talk to the patient, use a non-dominant arm, so that um, they're less likely to have an accidental removal. And um, if, um, if you cannot find an obvious uh, visible site, uh, avoid blind punctures and use um, technology to guide you. All good points. So, um, and with regard to assessment, a few additional things that are suggested with adults don't use lower extremities for fear of thromboembolism or throm thrombophlebitis. Pediatrics, you can have a broader smattering of choices. Avoid the antecubital area. With infants, you can use scalp, et cetera. So we're all familiar uh, with these um, guidelines. And another excellent source. So I, I, I spoke about the guidelines. They, and uh, you're probably all aware a recent um, revision came out in um, early this year, 2016. You should all get a copy of that. Here is a slightly older and uh, needed uh, a need to be updated um, textbook. Uh, last uh, revision, third editions from 2010, but really a solid uh, textbook with a ton of useful information. And again, I use it commonly. 
the, the information that they provide, um, uh, again, mirrors much of the INS guidelines that are there. Uh, avoid um, uh, areas of flexion, most digital site, etc. And then from another source, from the Association of Vascular Access in 2013, they put out some best practices in adult peripheral vascular access. It's a nice um, uh, little monograph, and it um, adds a few additional things and looks at it from a slightly different perspective, including what some high-risk sites might be and taking into account uh, in the lower section other high-risk areas of importance. But, um, but the truth is that as you look at this more carefully, you realize that the information provided is really at a high level. It is extremely limited information regard to optimal peripheral IV site choice. And why is that? Because we have been we have historically based all of our information in terms of what we can see with our naked eyes and what we can feel with our fingers. And that has led us down a difficult pathway. Just for, the, just for fun, I wanted to add two additional bits of information that have come out since the guidelines, which I thought were interesting. Um, these are two papers. Um, uh, the first one... It comes out of uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia, and it's a prospective, randomized, really nicely done obstetric study uh, looking at uh, a comparison of uh, catheters placed in the hand and the forearm. Conventional wisdom would suggest that the forearm is going to be better uh, for comfort and other things, but at least within this OB population, um, there uh, wasn't uh, a real difference with regard to uh, uh, patient um, satisfaction, comfort, complication, any of those things. And the, um, the first stick success rate was actually a little bit higher in the hand compared to the forearm. So, you know, it just goes against conventional wisdom, which I always like to do. Um, there's more information out there, and we need to pay attention to it, and this is a great paper. Um, Here's another paper that um, has just come out as well that's quite nice. And uh, this one is from the University of, and I'm sure I'm going to butcher this um, name because I can't speak Italian, Chieta Pescara. It's from the University of Chieta Pescara, uh, Italy. And again, it goes a little bit against conventional wisdom in that uh, it gives a reason for us to potentially place antecubital um, IVs. Uh, and largely that's, that's probably not a good idea, but at least with regard to uh, catheters that re are retained beyond 96 hours, the white bar is um, the cubital fossa has a lower rate of phlebitis relative to the other site. So I just I throw that out there because it was kind of interesting. So anyway, back to my original uh, hypothesis, you know, the the reality that with unaided eye and fingers, we are very limited on vein-based critical information. So just imagine, imagine if we use this same limited process to buy a luxury car, and we use only a few superficial details to describe our desire to purchase. So, okay, I want to buy a nice car, and I want it to have a sleek design, four tires, I want it to be a quality name brand, and I want it to see two people comfortably. You know, we've got an empty house now, and my wife and I, we're just going to go cruising down the road and looking good in a nice luxury car. Well, you know, that describes both of these cars very well. You know, in the upper panel, a, a, a Lamborghini uh, that is more expensive than most houses and really just you know, crazy uh, for just about any individual to own. And down below is a Mercedes-Benz that probably in its day was a great car, but it's uh, currently non-functional. We didn't ask critical questions. Does it run? You know, is the paint job intact? Um, uh, how old is it? Is it new? Is it used? So you have to really, if you really want 
to get an optimal outcome, you need to get into the details of the, what you're doing. That's so true in everything we do. So is it a surprise that based on our current superficial limited level of scrutinizing our peripheral IV sites, that we have such a tremendously high rate of failure? Can you imagine any other place? Just imagine if we had in our airline industry, a 50% failure rate, or in the automobile industry, yeah, honey, I, I went out for groceries, but I had to leave the car in the parking lot because, you know, it just wouldn't start. I mean, the reliability of most things in our life are tremendous, and the failure rate's extremely low. Why do we tolerate such an amazingly high failure rate with our patients and peripheral IV access? So, as I was going through uh, this presentation, it was originally going to be a different presentation, to be quite honest, and I was going to speak more to the how do you identify clues in, with interpreting your infrared to help guide you about uh, better veins. That will be a future um, uh, webinar that has value in itself. But I had an aha moment, um, and that aha, um, aha moment was, in a sense, profound, and in a sense, duh. It's just so simple. And here it is. If we are going to advance peripheral IV catheter insertion and reduce complications, we must embrace technology and better understand the dynamic relationship of the catheter within the vein, particularly its tip position relative to other intravenous structures. I am going to say that again. If we are going to advance peripheral IV catheter insertion and reduce complications, we must embrace technology and better understand the dynamic relationship of the catheter within the vein, particularly its tip position relative to other intravenous structures. Okay? So... What are the factors that impact um, peripheral IV catheter outcome? Everyone on this call could list a bunch of them. I, I throw up a few uh, critical ones. Site choice, skin, vein integrity, catheter materials, insertion technique, timb location, catheter vein size, catheter movement, site stabilization, what we put in it, and I'm sure a myriad of other factors. What things can we as clinicians influence on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, we can influence site choice, uh, though we often don't, right? We, we, we have kind of a stick-and-run approach because we have work to do and we don't have the tools or maybe the knowledge beyond the first couple things mentioned within our guidelines of how to proceed. Um, we can improve our insertion technique uh, I, I believe tip location is critical, uh, just like it's important for central venous access. I believe tip location with peripheral IVs is very important. Catheter vein size, very important, especially if you believe that you should preserve patient veins and not destroy them. Uh, stabilization, you know, we've spent a lot of time improving upon that, and I would say the science has come along dramatically. There's some very good securement devices out there right now. And infusate fluid, we can influence that to some degree, but, you know, the patient's going to depend upon whatever treatment course is necessary, so we as inserters won't necessarily influence that very much. So, the rest of my talk is going to be focusing around the importance of site choice. And honestly, I, I, I hope that I give you all an aha moment as well because this is important. So selection determines outcome is a common theme in medicine. You all know this. Uh, just imagine if we treated all cancer patients with the same protocols. Some would do well, some would do poorly. Do we do that? Of course not. We choose specific cancers, uh, a leukemia, even more specific. Leukemias of certain subtypes are going to get X treatment. Lymphomas get very different treatment. Solid tumors, still different. So 
outcome is totally dependent upon selection. In one of my own areas, I spend a lot of additional time beyond vascular access, which is ECMO. Patient choice, patient selection completely determines outcome. Why should it be any different with peripheral IV catheters? We have to be more, we have to practice smarter and pick our insertion sites better. So what are the ideal vein characteristics that we're shooting for? Yes, not across the joint. It's got to be of adequate size. You know, don't we wish all of our patients were healthy and had good support of subcutaneous tissue? We can't do much about that. And healthy vein walls. Again, we can try to find better ones, but a, a given patient has what they have. But we can search for straight pathways so that the, the tip of the catheter is less prone to be up against an obstruction. For sure, we don't like valves. Valves cause problems. So we would not like to have valves within the area of the catheter or catheter tip. We would like to make sure that the venous pathway doesn't have a thrombus and that there's good venous flow. Why do we go to central access for delivery of a lot of medication? Because there's a higher venous flow, better mixing and dilution of our caustic medications. Well, I bet that this whole business is on a continuum and that if we had if we chose veins of better flow, we would have better dilution and delivery of our medications, even on the peripheral level. And lastly, don't put your tip up against a tortuosity or bifurcation. With the amount of normal movement a catheter could have, you could easily lead to uh, an infiltration or extravasation injury. So um, what methods do we have currently for identification of some of these critical ideal uh, vein points? Not across the joint, well, our, our eyes, of course, it works very well. We can see readily where the joints are. We can flex the limb and find exactly where the breakpoints are. What about vein size? Well, if you're honest, you know, most of the time you cannot see vein size all that well with a patient. You can see a change in the skin, a lumping up of the vein, except for somebody that's got extraordinarily low body fat uh, you can't get a true sense of what the intraluminal diameter might be. Same thing with palpation, or even worse. I mean, palpation, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of people out there that have amazing tactile sense, uh, but it's hard to know exactly where those edges are and hence the diameter of the vein. Ultrasound, whoa, it doesn't get any better than ultrasound. That's a feature that, you know, if you have an ultrasound device, you can get measurements down to the 0.1 millimeter but many devices don't have that uh, kind of ease. Um, and then near-infrared. Near-infrared is great because it does, it's relatively easy to use, and it back projects exactly the width of the vein so that you have an immediate sense of uh, what is that vein diameter. And you can have a, a standard. You can have a, let's say, a... Uh, uh, a catheter you're, you don't plan on using, or or um, or maybe after you provide uh, a sepsis to the site, use the catheter you're using, put it down on top of the vein, you will know immediately, is this thing too large or not for that given vein? So uh, urine for it by far is the easiest one and most um, uh, easily accurate of those. What about a straight pathway? Well, if the vein is outside the body, and you can see the course, you can see it, but most of the time that's not going to be the case. Same thing with palpation. You can often palpate some portion of the vein, but a lot of the troubles we get into, particularly with phlebotomy, like in the antecubital fossa, is you can feel a sponginess there, but you really aren't sure where, what direction that thing is going. What about ultrasound? How easy is it to determine a straight pathway with ultrasound? Not so easy. You have to watch two things at the same time. You have to watch the screen and the patient. So unless you're cross-eyed and you can, you know, interpret that information, that's very hard to do. And lastly, uh, near-infrared, it's a no-brainer because it's all in front of you. So you can see those straight pathways very easily. Um, how about avoiding valves? The only thing that I've found that I can use to avoid valves is near-infrared. I have tried really hard to um, uh, use... Uh, near uh, ultrasound and identify uh, valves, try to get good pictures. It's taken me up to 30 minutes sometimes to get good quality images of valves, so it's tough. Um, what about identifying obstructions? Ultrasound can be quite good at that. Eyes and palpation, not so much. 
Uh, but ultrasound can, if you know how to interpret thrombus or areas of narrowed flow, ultrasound can be very good. Near infrared is awesome because you can milk the vein and you can see, is there a thrombus in it or not? Is there venous flow or not? And you can see it in a fraction of a second. So, so easy to use. So, uh, I, I kind of lump uh, identifying obstruction and venous flow together. And lastly, uh, catheter tip to valve um, positioning. Um, because you can't see valves very well, you can't use ultrasound very nice, easily to get that connection. Ultrasound is awesome to be able to see the pathway of the catheter, um, and if you, especially if you use like an in-plane view. But near-infrared, there's nothing like near-infrared for planning your sites because you can milk the vein, find where the valve is, and park the tip just short of it. Okay, so veins and valves. So here, you know, here's a typical patient that we're coming to. Um, you can see visibly two pretty good targets. If you were there and you were manipulating the arm, you would say, this is the target I'm going to go after. It looks just a little bit juicier. It may not show up on the, uh, the, this uh, uh, picture as easily, but that's likely many of you would do because it's slightly larger in reality, uh, and you would you would go after that as your peripheral IV target, bearing in mind, of course, that it's getting close to the wrist joint and all of the issues involved with that. You would probably insert back to the towards the fingers with the uh, of the arrow, and that's where you would go. The problem is, bonk, as soon as you do it, your catheter would hang up. Why? Because valves are booby traps within the vein that you cannot predict where they are. So, have you ever, have you ever blown a vein due to hitting a valve? Have you caused more pain to a patient from hitting a valve and then a second stick? Have you had IV pumps beep incessantly because the IV catheter tip is bumping up against a valve and you're having to retract it back, reposition it, whatever, in order to get better flow? Have you ever had reduced IV catheter flow because the IV catheter tip was against a valve? If you didn't say yes to every one of these questions, you're not placing peripheral IV catheters and paying attention because every one of those things are amazingly common. They occur all the time. And if you're placing enough catheters, you have experienced those things. Well, wouldn't it be nice not to have that happen? I, I know, I, since um, I have been um, using near-infrared a lot more in my practice, and I have had a, a, a dramatic reduction and slash elimination of these issues. So here's a static photo of near-infrared, which is helpful. And you can see, like I said, straightaways really well below the skin. And that's great. But it's not enough. What you need to do is you need to milk the vein. And you do that by occluding the distal portion of the vein. You swipe the, um, the blood uh, uh, towards the patient. And then you identify where you see that um, flat break there where my finger ends, the valve. So if you're going to do peripheral IV placement, you know, okay, there's the valve. I know I'm going to park my tip of my peripheral IV catheter away from that, and I'm going to avoid a valve. If you would have stuck this patient blindly, blindly, and I mean with your eyes, I'm calling that blind now because from an intravenous standpoint, it is blind. You have no idea, just using your eyes or your fingers, what structures are within the vein. I'm not talking about outside. So I think we need to get to a new level. So a blind stick includes all veins um, unless uh, uh, that you are not using near infrared because you need to interpret not just the external portion. We need to get more sophisticated and look at the intraluminal information that's provided. Here's another patient. And believe me, these are not hard to find. These were just serial patients of targets that um, one would typically go after. You can see. This is a, a somewhat juicy um, distal cephalic vein. Okay, this person is not a weightlifter or anything, but does not have a high BMI. 
And you can readily see the, the distal cephalic vein kind of uh, pumped up there. Um, now, if you would have just stuck it, even if you would have chosen a place away from the wrist, you would have gotten dinged because there's a great big valve right there. Again, here's the um, static photograph, which is, again, useful. You can see a prior scar um, on the uh, left uh, third of the catheter where there was a prior stick, but failure, interestingly. I didn't know this before, uh, and I didn't understand why until after I milked the vein. And then here's the uh, video. Now look at this. Do you see where that vein um, uh, uh, terminates? You, you see where the, the blood sort of stops there? That is where a valve exists. And so if you were placing a catheter uh, more distal to that site, you have a high probability of hitting that valve. It is using near-infrared for identifying better sites is as easy as swiping the vein as I'm showing you here. And you can find those uh, valves and help avoid them. And I believe if we start applying this regularly, we will increase our um, uh, success rate, reduce our failure rate due to um, uh, sticks that result in hematoma and other from hitting a valve, probably some degree of patient discomfort, et cetera. So I think there's a lot to be gained by more carefully scrutinizing the intraluminal structures of the vein. So um, here's the wrist, here's the valve. If I'm going to plan uh, this, of course, I want my extension set to be away from the wrist to allow maximum mobility uh, of the wrist. So I'm likely going to park my catheter here. I know the valve is there. The tip is going to be a good centimeter back or so. And in that way, we've got a forearm peripheral IV uh, that can be comfortable for the patient. Um, and I, I won't be able to have a big loop for my um, extension set, but uh, maybe I have to use like one of those T-connectors that we have for a more abrupt termination. But anyway, you get the point. Do better planning. What about this person? Uh, you know, so this person is a weightlifter, or at least a, a weightlifter wannabe, and um, is, is getting some nice bulging veins that are a tempting target. You know, when crazy people like us go to parties, you know, we're not looking at uh, suits and ties and shoes. We're looking at people's veins. Uh, we're a crazy lot. It's, there's no question. But here, this is a juicy vein. And this was an interesting thing. I was... Um, uh, milking this vein, and I could actually see, and it's, I don't know if you can tell on the video, where the valve um, is. You could, it, rarely you can see these uh, uh, with these superficial veins with not so much um, uh, subcutaneous tissue. So you could see where the, the vein was refilling to a point, but you really have to look carefully. So here I am milking that same vein. You see the valve? You see where as I milk the blood forward, it is held back by the valve, which functions as a dam. So again, it couldn't be easier, and we need to use this information. Here's another lady. Just to demonstrate, you just can't know where the valves are. There's almost always a valve at a bifurcation, but you don't know on which side of that bifurcation it sits. And here's a guy, really high BMI. You can't see or feel anything but I'm using um, near-infrared to help me plan a peripheral stick uh, in order to avoid a valve. So valveology, I uh, just made up that name. Um, valves are well known to interfere with optimal peripheral IV insertion functionality. It's difficult to predict. Uh, I would say impossible to predict where the valves are going to be. Rarely can you see with the naked eye. Very difficult to identify with ultrasound. Believe me, I'm a huge ultrasound advocate. I use it all the time with difficult uh, access. But if you want to be good, if you want to be comprehensively good at peripheral IV access, you need to have your optimal basal skills uh, with your eyes and your uh, fingers and understand the guidelines that are out there. You need to be good at, you need to be really good at using ultrasound and understand the, the finer points of it. A lot of people think they're really good, but understanding how to 
needle tip tracking and whatnot with ultrasound and how you can uh, reduce pass pointing and other issues. And lastly, and very importantly, you need to get good at near infrared. Near infrared is relatively easy to use. If, if, you're, if you're on your pathway of becoming expert with ultrasound, you'll find learning about near infrared very easy. Near infrared easily identifies valves by milking the vein. So it couldn't be simpler. And thus I say near infrared is necessary for optimal peripheral IV positioning regardless of vein difficulty. I don't care if you can see it with your eyes, if it's a weightlifter and they're skinny, we should be using it on all veins, if for no other reason, to identify where the valves are so we can avoid them. It's just so simple. What about finding a straight and wide vein? So, you know, wouldn't you love it if we had our patients coming in and they look like this? Um, a beautiful, long, straight, um, uh, median vein. It's just, it's gorgeous. You would just place it, you know, in old days at least, I would just, you know, pop one in there and run away and hope for the best. Well, truth be told, again, you don't know where the valves are, so I would be using near infrared. But what about the other issue that's very important and we're continuing to gain knowledge, which is the issue of catheter to vein ratio? How do you interpret that for most veins? Anybody that's got, you know, beyond 18-20% body fat, it's really hard to know what the true diameter of the vein is. Here we've got a vein, an obvious target, in a, uh, a different patient with a distal um, cephalic vein. What is the width? What is the diameter of that vein? We have no idea. You know, it's, it's underneath the skin, so you can't really tell. And what about here, where you know, maybe you can barely palpate something, but you can't see anything, you have no idea what, what the vein width is. So it's common when we're trying to pick an optimal site that there may be some portion of that we can see with our eyes or feel with our fingers. But the problem is we don't know what's downstream, and this gets, again, to the optimal positioning. Some of the failures that we have with catheters must be due to this um, observation, which is catheter tips against tortuosities, valves, bifurcations, etc. So technology can help us avoid these things. We can better position our catheters like in the center so that we avoid the tortuosities, bifurcations. And so we must find straightaways as much as we can to have our catheter cannula sitting within that straightaway and away from obstacles such as bifurcations, tortuosities, and valves. Also, very pertinent to this presentation, we need to be more selective about the diameter of the vein. Just because you can thread a catheter within a vein doesn't mean you should. I'm going to say that again. Just because you can thread a catheter in a vein doesn't mean you should. We've got to up our game, and we need to consider the uh, veins uh, as valuable resources and try to preserve them, not blow them, not thrombose them. So uh, let's try using technology to pair catheter size with vessel size. What information that we do we have? Well, we know from Verkov. Uh, back in the 18th century, that there's a relationship between um, uh, flow, injury, and the probability of um, uh, a thrombosis. We've known this a long time, so, so that's one bit of information out there. And slowly, there is increasing information in the literature relative to the ratio of the catheter to vein and how that increases the probability of thrombosis. So um, we have within this paper by Sharp um, in the International Journal of Nursing Studies, uh, uh, they suggest that there should be a cutoff. Now, their ratio is maybe a little bit higher than others would say, but they're, from the data that they have with PIC catheters measuring vein diameter, um, 
they suggest that no higher than a catheter to vein ratio of it taking up more than 45% of the lumen, essentially 50% of the lumen. So it's a start. It may be because their ranges are too high and their numbers are too low. It may not be enough information for us. But still, it's a good place to start and it's the right idea. And then here's a classic study. Tom Nifong um, uh, has done uh, some different work relative to modeling, experimental modeling, and looking at low reductions of uh, various sized um, wires, in this case wires, within uh, the lumen of um, an experimental model and seeing how flow reduction occurs. I should have put a red line or circles up here. I apologize. Let's look at the upper. So you see under measure on the left-hand side, it says outer tube four millimeters. If you look at, you go down one, two, three things that says relative flow. If you have no obstruction like a catheter within the vessel, 100% flow. I want to point out how quickly you see a reduction in flow with a gradual increase in the size of the vessel. Again, this particular study was directed towards um, uh, peripheral um, um, uh, uh, pick for um, peripherally inserted uh, IV catheters, central catheters, picks. And you see serially how with um, increasing external French, you have dramatic reduction in flow. Nobody is surprised by this. Uh, but it is a nice presentation of the impact of flow. And if you're reducing flow, you're going to have stagnant stagnation of blood and a propensity towards thrombosis. So how do we take this kind of information and use it in real life? Here's a vein. You can't really tell what the um, external, uh, the in, I'm sorry, internal diameter of the vein is. So um, we can try to put a catheter up to it. Does that tell us anything? Are we able to judge catheter to vein ratios? Most of the time, I find no, and I try. Same thing here. Okay, here's a 22 gauge and maybe a slightly less blurry uh, picture. You can't. You just can't. So you, take, uh, you have a static look at the vein using near-infrared. The back projection is exactly the right width. There's the vein, the potential target. It's a nice straight one. Here's the catheter. So the vein projection is exactly right. Here you have the catheter width right next to it. You can immediately see, like with this um, catheter, how much of the lumen it's taking up. Uh, okay, here as well. Okay, here is a, a vein underneath the skin, and you can palpate it even easier. Maybe you can't see it very well with your eyes. Near infrared, immediately you can see what the internal diameter of that vessel is, I can lay a catheter down next to it, and look at that. That's about perfect. That's going to take up about a third of the lumen, and it's going to be a great catheter for this patient. Probably in doing so, we'll be able to preserve the flow and the use of that vein for the future. So optimal catheter to vein size. It is difficult with our eyes and our fingers to estimate the real vein size for most access. Palpation even harder. So ultrasound is good, but because it's harder to know the straightaways, it gets a little clunky to, to try to deploy in this way. So near-infrared easily identifies the straight, straightaways and projects the exact vein width with um, some of the products on the market. Thus, near-infrared, in my opinion, is necessary for optimal peripheral IV catheter to vein strategies to preserve flow and integrity. Okay, one last section. Thank you for hanging in there, and I'll try to be brief. We've all been here. We've been asked to draw blood uh, for a patient. Maybe it's just a routine phlebotomy, and I'll show you an example in a minute of um, uh, trying to get a sterile blood culture. So classic situation. You have a patient without visibly obvious veins, though you palpate, and there is no question there's a target under there. You palpate, and you feel the sponginess. Okay, there it is. It's in the place it typically is. And if you look at um, the anatomy pictures in the book, much of the time the veins run along the axis of the arm or at an angle, right? Well, 
Um, if you were doing your the typical approach and you were doing a stick on this patient, you would probably you would feel that sponginess and pretend that catheter is a a, a needle uh, system for drawing blood. You're going to stick like that probably. Well, you are going to have a hematoma in a percentage of patients and a non insignificant. So it, it's going to happen with some regularity where you're going to get some issues of either inadequate flow, hematoma, or other. Why? Well, because the patients don't read the textbooks and they have all kinds of variability of their venous anatomy. And here's a classic example. Look at how curvilinear that vein is. So if you're taking it on in a straightaway, you can easily puncture the wall uh, or kind of sideswipe it and really not get an adequate uh, outcome. So if you were using near infrared at the same time, strategically, you would come in from the side and bias towards being within the lumen because you're directing the um, uh, needle into the lumen of the vessel. So again, I find it very valuable and it certainly increases my success rate. Here's another example. Okay, you're working up a clabsy. You're, you're in the ICU, the floor, patient may have a central line and you have to get a peripheral culture or, or maybe they just are febrile and, and you'd have to get a peripheral culture. Okay, so you, same kind of thing. You know, you, you palpate, you feel some sponginess, and then you do the stick. You do a straight on or slightly angled stick because you kind of think you know the direction of the vein, but you don't. Okay, you stick, you adjust, you stick, you, you move your needle, and guess what? You get no blood back, and the patient is cringing. And, um, uh, and then by the second time, they're saying, ouch, they were good with you the first time. And with increasing movement of your needle, there's more complaining, um, uh, rightfully so. It hurts. Um, I, you know, when giving blood, I'm always a three-stick, and I hate it. I, I hate uh, being stuck. So, um, so here we have the difficulty and reality of clinical practice. Okay, so what if we use near-infrared and we actually looked at the directionality of the vein? Again, this person didn't read the textbook. And their antecubital vein there is um, in a more lateral direction. So you felt a really good sponginess, but um, even we're overshooting as going, shooting over the top of it. So if you were coming in from a lateral direction, you would avoid having to put your hands within the field, which may contaminate your specimen, by the way. Because what do people do after they get into the skin and start moving the, vein, the, the needle around? They start maneuvering. They change the direction of their needle in order to try to find that intraluminal area, and then they bring their hand in and palpating more potentially contaminating. What's gonna, what is a contaminated blood culture going to lead to? A false positive blood culture? You may get dinged because of that, because how do you know in the space of a febrile patient whether that's correct or not? that can lead down a whole nasty pathway of antibiotics, prolonged uh, hospitalization, the whole bit. So you, don't, you want to avoid false positive blood cultures uh, like crazy. There's so much additional cost and expense uh, with it uh, and inefficiency. So what about blood draws? Have you ever had it happen where you're trying to draw blood and suddenly um, it stops? And you can't quite understand why. Well, if you would have milked this vein in advance, you would have known that there is a valve right along that straightaway. And what is being done here is as the blood is being drawn out, you can see the vein is becoming pale. So they oversized the uh, vein a little bit with too large of a catheter. Uh, and uh, it is blanching before your eyes there. Uh, because all of the blood is being removed and none is refilling it. And you can't pull the blood on the other side of the valve. It is not coming to you. So what do people do? They manipulate the catheter thinking that it's up against something or whatever, which, you know, in a sense, I suppose it is. Uh, and what the result is you may lose the sight. Well, with the use of near-infrared, you know exactly what you're doing. You're draining that area. You have to wait, it, wait for it to refill you may have to decide, okay, I'm going to disconnect. I'm going to put it in the red top or whatever and to make, or, or whatever, or maybe the purple top and prevent it from clotting and then go back when it refills and uh, get, a, get some more specimens. So it helps make you 
practice a little smarter. Optimal blood draws. It's often hard to get an adequate volume of blood for blood draws. Due to the difficulty of identifying vein size and um, directionality, especially for palpable veins, this may result in multiple sticks or, as in the case of getting blood culture, site contamination. Near infrared easily identifies vein directionality and size, allowing for better vein choice. Thus, near infrared will help reduce multiple sticks and achieve full intended volumes and reduce contamination of blood cultures if appropriately employed. employed. So, um, summary for my presentation is uh, the following. There is minimal data regarding optimal access site choice. We have the guidance that we have is limited to very superficial information within quality documents. You know, the, the, the uh, infusion nursing information is top notch. The problem is we have only been going as far as our eyes, our naked eyes and fingers will take us. We need to move beyond this. If we're going to attack this high catheter failure rate. So we need to better understand that relationship between the intraluminal environment and the catheter, not just superficial external information. So vision and palpation are unable to identify valves and other problems. And that is the limitation of our current practice. Near infrared identifies venous obstacles. Near infrared will allow for better peripheral IV planning. And I believe that near infrared is going to, you'll find it to be best for finding optimal peripheral sites. I have tried every which way to think about this, and it's just the logical conclusion that you come to. I hope I meant to put this forth as kind of a logical argument because it leads you in only one place. There aren't any other good ways to do this that I can think of or readily employ. So near infrared is best for finding optimal peripheral IV sites. I would like to thank you all very, very much for tuning in. Um, this stuff is fun. Uh, I hope as part of this that as I've inspired people. There's some amazing researchers out there. And if you're not a researcher, think about it. Think about, um, you know, uh, putting out some effort. It's a ton of work, but it's also very satisfying. So help to add to our knowledge base and to push us forward. So we're doing, we're picking sites better. We're bridging the gap in all of our significant knowledge gaps in an area where we should have much better control. You know, there's just tremendous gaps relative to peripheral access that we need to close and improve patient care. So I'm going to um, uh, now stay online for questions. Uh, if you have other questions um, later, I'd be happy to answer them as well. I put up my um, email address. Uh, please give me some days, uh, sometimes weeks, to respond. Uh, I get a fair bit of email. Um, and um, Aaron told me to put up this slide. Um, uh, there's a, uh, a question and answer um, uh, survey monkey link there. And there's also a, a link for uh, Christie Medical down below where you can get more information as well. So please uh, use those things, and I will turn it back over to Erin to try to field any questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Shear. So yeah, that SurveyMonkey link is actually your link to get your CE credit. Um, you don't have to furiously right away. You can. Um, you can relax a little bit. That survey link will be sent out to each of the participants via email afterwards. Uh, if you happen to be in a room with a group of people, you are very welcome to share that email link with your colleagues so that they can get their CE credit as well. Um, we have a lot of questions that have come in, so I'm going to go through as many of them as we can without going too far over the hour. We will answer all of your questions. We'll get Dr. Shears to answer all of the questions, and anything that we don't get to on this particular session right here, we will send it to everyone via email afterwards so that everybody's got their answers. Uh, so starting oh, out. Can I throw in something? Can I throw in something, absolutely. too? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, for um, you know, for the for the audience, if there are things 
that um, are of interest around these topics that uh, you would like to see added into the presentations. Uh, I actually do pay total. I pay complete attention to that, and um, uh, so uh, you know, this is about trying to structure this so that it is useful for everyone. So please, um, as you submit comments or things, um, make your suggestions. You're all learned, experienced people that are doing this, and we we honestly we we have similar problems. Uh, so. Um, uh, I, I have my own point of view and the issues that I see, but uh, bring in your experience and, and help to, to move this whole process forward. So in your comments and things, give suggestions about topics or other. Excellent. Yeah, and the follow-up email that you guys will all receive will also have a link where you can submit any future topics that you would like to see. So we, as Dr. Shear said, we definitely take that into account in planning these webinar sessions. So getting started with our first question. Uh, all right, Dr. Shears, you spoke about the accuracy of near-infrared. Does it matter if a tourniquet is on? Does that impact the image accuracy? That's a great question. And I wish, I wish somebody would pay me to just do research because there's so many cool questions, uh, and that's one of them. I'll, I'll tell you what my belief is. Um, there is uh, so what is the what is the predominant um, utility of a tourniquet? Now we would all say to some degree that there is a slight change in the vein size. Some veins more so than others. It's not uniform. It, once you get into the weeds on this thing, uh, you'll find that veins have different characteristics. Um, even within the forearm, I've looked at interesting things like responsiveness to warm and cold, how much they dilate or not. It's variable. It, maybe it has to do with innervation or the amount of smooth muscle or other things. So I say that in that um, with regard to putting on a tourniquet, many people believe that it significantly changes the size of the vessel. And it does change the size to a limited degree of some vessels. However, the main reason that you're applying a tourniquet is to prevent the blood as you're doing a stick from getting pushed downstream. So it causes you to have a lumen. It, it obstructs venous flow. And if, if you just push on a vein without a tourniquet, it just collapses right down. And if you're doing a stick, the, the wall of the lumen just collapses right away. And you may not have a lumen, and you're going to go do a through-and-through -through stick, have a hematoma, blah, 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 So uh, unless you're inserting in a certain way. So the tourniquet's primary function is to preserve the lumen. So uh, a longer answer than you probably wanted, but the tourniquet may increase the visual, the, the size of the vein if that vein is distensible, and it all has to do with characteristics of that particular vein. But you will not notice a big change. And I have, to a superficial degree, looked at this with both near-infrared and ultrasound for changes, but I have yet to do the formal study. All right, excellent. Um, next question. Do you have any advice for getting staff to look for IV sites in the forearm? Even though the standards say this, the go-to site for a lot of our staff is still the hand. I'm sorry, Erin, would you please repeat the question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're asking, do you have any advice for getting staff to look for IV sites in the forearm? Even though the standards say this, the go-to site for our staff is still the hand most of the time. Oh, I see. Um, so what can we do to encourage people to look in the forearm? Um, yes. It, um, you know, my advice would be, uh, again, getting people to change, you know, again, boy, you ask complicated questions that on the surface seem simple. And um, getting people to change is a difficult thing. Um, you... Um, uh, if I were a, um, a CNS 
and I was trying to educate my group. I, I would, one, generate a protocol and get buy-in from the group um, and say, you know, our goal is to, let's say, uh, work towards the, um, if, you're, if you wanted to, as a group, predominantly use the poor arm. There's some literature, certainly, and guidance to support the more predominant use of the forearm. Um, uh, you would protocolize it out so there's an expectation. Uh, you would educate why that would be the case, and you would have to audit and follow up. Um, uh, the, one of the problems, of course, is that how people wear their adipose and where you can find targets. So it's often the case that you can see more venous targets in the hand than you can in the forearm just because of how um, uh, adipose distributes in the body. Uh, and so the practical thing is if you're not going to use technology, for example, to help you, uh, it's going to be more challenging to try to enforce the use of forearms for the simple reason that they may not have the targets to go after. So you would, if you wanted to be successful, you probably also have to incorporate um, uh, uh, visualization-enhancing technology to identify uh, better targets. It's that, you know, you can have a long discussion about how do you create meaningful change. It's complicated. I've, I've tried to study this because uh, creating change within uh, 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 a healthcare environment can be extraordinarily challenging and frustrating. But there is a methodology, if you follow, that can be successful. But, it, you know, that's a, that's a whole lecture itself. Right. All right. So uh, next question. Would this device be used for a dedicated vascular access team, or can it be used by a bedside nurse? It can be used by anybody. Um, uh, just like with anything, um, the, what you get out of it is going to depend upon what you put into it. Uh, you have to understand the limitations of the device. You have to understand what it is you're trying to do. Um, so uh, one of my intents is to put together a, uh, a webinar around sort of advanced um, utilization of near-infrared devices and interpreting what you see. Because it isn't just as simple as there's a black line, let's put a catheter in it. And I, I, I know I'm, uh, I, I, please don't cringe on that. I, I'm not being, I'm trying to be a simpleton here. But th there is more to it. There's, um, for one thing, you know, with, with some of the devices, the resolution is so amazingly good. You see veins that you should not stick. They're too small. And it's necessary for you to look at that, um, the, the ratio. Um, so uh, there's, um, there's a lot to be gained with the use of near-infrared and uh, its application towards um, uh, access. Um, did I, I, did I answer the full question there, Erin? Um, I drifted there a bit. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, the, I, I can just add in that there's no limitation, there's no uh, specification that the device oh, should be Oh, yeah, for an individual. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, right. Yeah. Let me follow up. Let me follow up. Um, so the, the tool in educated hands whether it is a bedside nurse who's now devoted to becoming an expert at vascular access or with an IV team. So the, the likelihood would be with all of the knowledge that a vascular access team has, they're likely to, one, understand the issues faster and probably ramp up and better deploy it more quickly. But anybody can use it. It's just, you know, you just got to spend time to learn how to, to do so. Great. Yeah, I think that definitely answers the question. Uh, next question. So uh, we have, with the knowledge that near-infrared can see 10 millimeters deep, is there a comparison for how deep a healthcare practitioner is able to see or palpate a vein? Sure. Um, so, uh, so visually, it depends, of course. Um, and it also, it depends on a number of different factors, how good your color vision is, for one, um, and uh, how, um, so you could have a person with relatively 
thin sub Q so that there's very little distorting the color difference of the vein and you could readily see the, the bluish red tinge beneath the skin surface. Um, and there's, um, uh, so with regard to how far, and, and, you know, truth be told, there are some vascular access experts that have amazing, um, uh, what would you call it, um, their ability to discern fine points through palpation is extraordinary. I am not at that expert level. My my point-to-point uh, -point discernment with my finger is not as good as others. I know that. Uh, I have seen some amazing um, vascular access nurses that they can just feel the, the finest things. So there's a lot of variability. I suppose it's genetic or other uh, where there are people have different capabilities there. Uh, so uh, to give you a single answer, it's hard. But what I would say is that uh, most peripheral veins within the hand forearm area are less than five millimeters deep. And that may surprise you, but most that we go after with peripheral IVs um, are five millimeters or less. And um, palpation has to do, your ability to palpate has to do with several factors. Um, you know, the how sensitive your fingertip happens to be, of course, I mentioned that. Also, the size of the vessel and other tissues overlying it. Adipose can feel very spongy and can be misleading. Uh, so um, it, it's, it's multifactorial. If you have a huge vein, like a vein four millimeters or greater, that's half a centimeter below the skin, you may very easily be able to palpate that. But if that same vessel is three millimeters, you may not be able to discern it from the adipose around it. So there's a lot of different factors that seem to influence the ability of an individual to palpate and or see vessels. Um, with regard to near infrared and depth, um, uh, it depends, you know, the, the depth of visualization, visualization, I have seen veins down to 1.2 centimeters or 12 millimeters myself. And it all depends on how much um, fibrous tissue, fibrous bundles there are. So, for example, if there is a vein underneath a muscle or fiber sheath, even though it may be superficial, you're not going to see it due to the scatter of near infrared. A, a good example of that is the cephalic vein uh, uh, near the wrist. It's common that um, you you know you have a bodybuilder kind of person coming in with these massive uh, cephalic veins, and you won't be able to see it with near infrared, even though with your eyes you can see it. It's one of the weird exceptions. And the reason is because for the insertion of muscle, uh, they have a lot of thick fibrous tissue which deflects the near infrared. So within the forearm, near infrared handles the majority of the, the veins because um, the, the muscle insertions are down below the adipose. But when you get to a point at um, uh, near the wrist and along where the distal cephalic is, you may not be able to see uh, that with near infrared, even though you can see it with your eyes. And people think, oh, this near infrared is messed up. And no, it's not that at all. It has to do with um, the relationship of subcutaneous uh, fibrous tissue and how it deflects near infrared, not allowing the machine to interpret it. If you're away from those areas, um, it can easily see uh, the veins and give you a good picture of the um, diameter of the vein underneath the skin. So it's hard to specifically answer your question, um, but um, uh, uh, the, the depth of sight uh, is variable depending on the amount of sub-Q and other muscle and the, the depth of palpation depends upon how discerning the given finger is uh, that the, the, the individual is using and other features, as I said. So again, a bit long-winded on the answer, but that's the reality of practice. Thank you. Okay, we'll just do a couple of more questions. Like I said, uh, I didn't want to run too far past 
the hour, and but we will answer all of your questions, and we'll send them out to everyone via email. So uh, next question, are there any special considerations for pediatric patients? Um, yes. Love them. Take good care of them. They're precious um, patients. Special considerations. Um, so I'm a, my first training's in pediatrics, and, um, uh, you know, we take unfortunate liberties with adult patients, uh, and I have a real soft spot with regard to the care of uh, pediatric patients. They are, you know, especially the ones less than three years of age, they have no idea why we're coming at them with a needle. And we need to be on our best in terms of making sure that we're not thinking it's okay to get away with multiple sticks to get access. Um, they don't know why you're causing pain, and we should, with appropriate sedation, with appropriate um, holding, uh, provide the best access we can with the fewest sticks. Um, if you can't readily see things, sometimes these little cherubs have a lot of pudge on them, and you can't see or feel anything. Get good at uh, visualization technology so you can deploy it with these most fragile of our patients and, um, and try to stick them less. So again, sorry about the soapbox thing, but um, uh, it's, um, we have to protect our most vulnerable patients, and those exist at the extremes of age. Great. And uh, last question, and I think it will be kind of an extension of the question before. Have you used this type of device on a neonatal population? Can it assist in pick placement? Uh, yes. Um, I have used it uh, with a neonatal population. Interestingly, so anybody that, um, I, so, so I'm an older school guy, um, and when I did my pediatric residency way back when in the 80s, um, I did a lot of NICU time, and um, it wasn't as regulated as it was now. So um, those of you that practice in this arena, it's a, it's a, it's a total subspecialty of its own. The, the very small, um, you know, the 500 grammars, uh, the 23, 24 weekers, you can see through their skin, and you hardly need anything, but their vessels are so tiny, so, so incredibly small. Their, their skin is more gelatinous. Um, as they uh, grow older, uh, they're quite thin, and consequently, there's very little resistance to um, penetration, for example, of near-infrared. So to answer your question, yes, it, it absolutely can be used as an adjunct for placing pick lines and other, because you can often uh, get a better... A sense of um, where the vein is with near infrared because unlike the much older counterpart where you've got deposition of a lot of adipose and uh, um, fibrous tissue going in, they don't have very much development of that, so you can more readily see through the skin. Um, it's uh, you, you, you know, other things people would worry about naturally would be we, we try to protect our most vulnerable. Near infrared light is actually safer than visible light. So um, it has a lower energy output. So the, um, it compared to just sunlight or, or normal room uh, fluorescent light, uh, near-infrared has a lower energy output, so it's safer. So there's no issue there. And uh, so absolutely, I would say have a look at your population and see where it can be useful. It's not going to answer all things, but it will enhance your practice and help improve it. Excellent. And uh, last order of business, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask you to uh, advance your slide one more because I know you have a reference slide, uh, and then that way we'll capture those references on the recording. Um, but that is okay. all the time that we have for questions. Again, like I said, we will answer everyone's questions with Dr. Shears and make sure that they are sent out to, uh, to everybody that has participated. If you have any questions after the session, please, by all means, you can send them to info at christymed.com, and we will make sure that they get to Dr. Shears, and we'll get everything answered for you. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Shears. It was a wonderful presentation. I'm seeing a lot of that in the comment section. Excellent presentation, excellent session. 
And uh, thank you all of the participants for joining us. We really appreciate your time in helping to learn more about improving peripheral IV access. So thank you, everybody, and have a yeah, wonderful afternoon. Thanks, Erin, and thanks, uh, Christy Medical, for the opportunity. Um, this is important, and you know, the, the vascular access community is uh, a relatively small community, and we need to pull together and keep making things better. I want to put in another plug. Uh, the AVA conference is coming up uh, in September. I think it starts like the 15th or 16th. If you have an interest in vascular access, please come to that. It's an excellent collection of individuals concerned about vascular access, and you will find a home of, of equally concerned people that are trying to make care better. So, um, and it's in Orlando. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Just avoid the alligators. But uh, uh, I hope to see you there. Great. Thank you so much. And then with this, we'll go ahead and end the presentation and appreciate everyone's participation.